to begin. This is, this is where I'm from. So I am a South Londoner, born and bred, born in Tooting at St George's Hospital. And um, for as long as I can remember, I have been interested in local history. And I think it has something to do with being the daughter of immigrants. I'm really interested in um, people's stories and how they kind of uh, re retain a kind of sense of identity and, and stories that link people to their places and stories kind of from what I like to kind of s describe as kind of from the underneath, the, the stories of the ordinary person in their places and the places that they inhabit and how they're preserved and retained. So a little bit of an introduction and I was studying at the RCA and I was starting to think more kind of formally about these ideas and, and how knowledge and history and stories from places are preserved and um, small narratives rather than kind of sort of grand historical narratives and why certain stories in places seem to linger while others are forgotten. I was sort of thinking about um, how local history is recorded and how kind of knowledge is preserved by people uh, and I was looking at it sort of at the focus of my um, MA dissertation but with particular kind of focus on this narrative that I had discovered um, so I grew up in Balham which is just kind of down the road from Tooting it's sort of like a leafy South London suburb some of you are smiling so I know that you know where it is it's sort of um, I should say that there's a kind of, when I say that I'm interested in local history, there's a kind of narrative that I've always been interested in. And it's to do with things that are sort of quietly extraordinary, extraordinary lived experiences or kind of remarkable narratives that seem to take place in um, sort of seemingly unremarkable places. But we all know that places are not unremarkable because where there are people, there are incredible narratives. But I grew up down the road from this house, the Priory. I did not grow up in a house that looked like that. This is the only house in the neighbourhood that looks like this. And it would have been one of the first houses, you know, in, in that area. And it lies just on the edge of the commons, which you can kind of, you know, this is Tooting Commons, so I grew up down the road from here. And there is this house called the Priory, and it was the site of an infamous Victorian murder mystery. So I was looking at all of these themes in my dissertation, how, you know, how kind of, um, 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 how, how history is preserved, but particularly in, in kind of informal ways. And I didn't really know so much about this story. I had sort of an of knowledge that a, that a murder mystery had happened. Um, uh, whatever, uh, uh, something kind of, his, you know, sort of significant, but I didn't know much about it. It didn't take me very long to find out that this extraordinary narrative had taken place just down the road where I'm from. And you can see here the kind of three um, sort of main uh, people involved in this story. And what I very quickly discovered through a Google search, essentially, it just gave me enough information that I could take to the local history archives and find out that actually something that read just like an Agatha Christie novel happened down the road from where I grew up. And it had all these, I mean, it was so archetypal. There's the beautiful, young, badly treated wife. There's the doctor, very respectable in his day, who she has an affair with. And there's the bad, the baddie, the husband who is poisoned in the house. And what I very quickly discovered, because there's no resolve, that actually so many studies and theories existed around this narrative. So actually what was happening was um, I felt a kind of a willingness to kind of preserve this narrative that couldn't be resolved because a murder mystery can't be resolved. And there was something about the nature of this story that meant that it had so many different points of interest. So people, so I should say that this is, um, this happened in, I think um, I could have, uh, you know, five years ago, I could have told you the exact date, but I think it was 1876. So all the people that are kind of, all the academics that are interested, or people generally that are interested in kind of Victoriana had their own point of view. 
we don't know, but we suspect that Florence Bravo, um, who's the lady, we suspect that she was the culprit, but we don't know. So then it kind of takes on a kind of feminist, the feminists have their own point of view, but then there were also lots of kind of journalistic problem solving inquiries. There were also dramatizations. So there was a, it, there was a TV series, I think, written by Julian Fellows that looked at kind of infamous um, London based murder mysteries. So there were all these various kind of different inquiries and kind of points of interest. But also there was the house. Now this house looks like that today, which is exactly the same as it looked at the time of the murder. So there's also this kind of very physical site, this kind of landmark that in a way is this kind of beacon, this ruin that, I mean, it is not a ruin in that very literal sense, it is being used. Um, now it's lived in, it's turned into flats and it's been used in various different ways but it is a reminder, a kind of um, monument to this um, this event that happened in this place. So I am writing about this for my dissertation um, it's very easy for me to talk about this now but my ideas about the, the kind of subject area that I'm looking at are kind of much more informed. But at the time, I was just interested in local history. I'd found out about this interesting story. It was revealing itself to me, and I was finding out so much more about it. There was so, it was so much more, um, to be honest, interesting than I thought it was going to be. So I took myself down to the, the local history archives, and I just took all the information I could um, about the house. And it transpired that... Um, there were lots of like local newspaper clippings from the 1970s. So in the 1970s, they wanted to demolish the house. There's uproar. So again, there's this kind of willingness by the local community to, to kind of preserve this place. I forgot that's interesting because where are we sort of preserving this history by preserving this building? So I'm looking, you know, there's lots of mention of kind of ghosts and the history and the murder. But then I find an article a clipping, which sends a kind of jolt through me. So I'm reading it, you know, I'm really familiar now, yeah, okay, it was whatever. They're trying to knock it down, there's uproar, but in this article, it says, it's quite blurry, so you might not be able to read it, but it says, the mansion was built on the site of a 13th century priory. That house is called the Priory. It's said to be a fine example of Strawberry Hill Gothic architecture, and this is the nugget several underground passages left from the old priory run from the house, one leading to St. Leonard's Church in Stratton. So this is my neighbourhood, this is my area. I am, I am right in the thick of writing this dissertation and this just derails me because I remember when I was at school down the road, literally from where I grew up, here at Laura Trait, Roman Catholic All Girls School. I remember being a schoolgirl, those schoolgirls, and this is this photograph is really important to me because the girls they don't wear that uniform anymore. It's such a tiny low res image that I've pulled off the internet, but it's really important because that is the basketball pitch. And I remember sitting almost in that location, cross-legged, on a damp bit of concrete, hearing my friend say to me, there are tunnels underneath South London, my big brother told me, and they link up all the old asylums. And it's so the inmates could roam underneath without disturbing the people above. And I remember thinking, oh, I hadn't thought, I mean, this is how long, maybe like 10 years post? I mean, and this actually, me studying, that was almost what, how long were we students? Like eight years ago, eight years ago? So I haven't thought about underground tunnels for a, you know, a long time. I mean, I, I, I don't think I'd ever thought about them. I knew, you know, I sort of, because I'm interested in local history, I know that there are stories about a priory that may or may not have existed. I also know that South London was a place where there were lots of asylums, as they were called then. And I just had this moment when I thought, maybe these tunnels are the tunnels that I remember the schoolgirls talking about. And I'm, like I said, I'm writing my dissertation and I think, do you know what, Sally up the road, St. Leonard's Church, I know it well, I'll go up there. I don't know what I'll find, but I'll just take a walk. And I do remember walking up, it's near the common, 
And I remember walking up and thinking, what the hell am I going to do when I get there? Am I going to ask them about underground tunnels? You know, what, what am I going to do? And I just thought, you know what, I'll just go and I will, I'll walk around the church and I'll just see what happens. And if nothing, you know, whatever, no big deal. I'm just going up the road. And I walk around and it's a very friendly, you know, C of E church. And, you know, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's been there since before the doomsday and it's got a historic kind of crypt with some kind of um, sort of very well-known respectable families in it, the Thrails, whatever, it's sort of bits of kind of local significance. You know, Dr. Johnston was said to have kind of stayed with the Thrail family when he was in South London. They've got a very old bit of brick. You know, it, you know it's, it's one of those places. And I think this is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not gonna ask them about underground tunnels. And I turn on my heel to leave, and someone says to me, a voice says to me, is there anything I can help you with? And I think, oh, sorry, I'll just ask. So I'm interested, I've read this article, da 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 da, and I would like, I just wanted to know, I've heard this story about underground tunnels. And um, is it, could you tell me anything about that? Would anyone be able to kind of shed a bit of light on that? And this person said to me, wow. You're speaking to the right person because I am the local archivist, local historian. And he said, okay, so do you know what a crypt is? Yes, I know what a crypt is. And um, John Brown led me into the crypt and he said, watch out because if you're a bit squeamish, you you are gonna see a bit of bone, that's fine. And I went into this kind of um, beautiful, beautiful, I think it was beautiful, um, sort of wrought iron spiral staircase and he showed me a bricked up archway and he told me the truth about those tunnels and there is a truth there is when I say truth a tricky word I know I always feel as soon as I say that I'm going to get pounced on but there is something of the truth in it was it as this, those schoolgirls were kind of talking uh, you know was it the sort of same premise perhaps not but there was an element of something there. And I left and I went back to my dissertation and I finished it and this was a footnote because the focus was something else, but it was something as a, as a person, as a human being, as a, an artist, as a, I couldn't quite get it out of my system, although I didn't know what to do with it. But I knew that I kind of, I knew that I, I started making these drawings And I felt at that time, I had the knowledge that what I was trying to do was document these tunnels, perhaps not the reality of them, but how I felt they were manifesting through these kind of schoolgirl stories and these schoolyard mythologies. Because what was happening, I feel, is that knowledge of these underground spaces, which are there, is being preserved, perhaps without intention or without awareness, but through this kind of retelling, and they've been almost, I think, turned into mythology, removed from historical time, spinning around in the ether, but it does in a way serve to kind of preserve knowledge of these spaces. So again, I feel that I am trying to create a sort of document of this narrative, but that also plays on the muddle the kind of, what I think of is these kind of joining of kind of tectonic plates and the kind of eruption and what happens when a, a bit of historical kind of accuracy and truth gets mixed in with hearsay and gossip, Chinese whispers. So now I am, it's something that has never quite left me and I've always gone back to it. it's in the background. I've had more formal projects going on and again, um, I am now, as, um, uh, um, as Sinead mentioned, I'm a PhD student, and my ideas are much more, you know, becoming, I should say, much more formalised with regards to the kind of work I make. So I was, I was just working instinctively at this point, but what I realised now is I was trying to create a kind of narrative space, an unsure narrative space, and documenting these stories 
in much in the same way that I found, you know, I pulled stories out of the archive, and I am now trying to create a kind of a witness of these narratives that perhaps can go back into the archive and sit along. I'm almost done, which is nice for everybody, um, including me. Um, so now I am um, thinking about my PhD, and um, which I'll talk very. I'll just tell you the title in a minute. I've started to revisit this work and pull together all the different kind of strands of research that I had. I didn't even realise how much I'd accumulated because, again, it's one of those projects that is always going on. Or, and I'm, I'm of that land, I'm of that landscape. So I have started to think about what happens when I pull all of these different bodies of knowledge together. So I have my own interpretation, I have work from the archive, clippings, different narrative voices, and this is me now just starting to pull it together and this is, so that work, those first drawings were, what, eight years ago? And this is a photograph that I took yesterday in my studio, because I'm just now, even now, whether the, how this work will be resolved, I'm not sure. I think it will always go on. Um, but it is the work, um, it, it is the inquiry that led me to my PhD. So the title um, of my PhD is Facilitator, Interpreter and Archivist, Generating Vernacular Histories. That's, some, that's, I mean, that's the way I phrase it. People, stories and how they document knowledge, I would say informally, um, vernacular histories through participatory illustration practice. So I'm really interested in this idea of parallel narratives, stories from the past, how they manifest now, how they have kind of, maybe there are parallel narratives that attach itself to people and places. And these are my main kind of research points. So how can illustration, I am an illustrator, I'm a storyteller, um, how can illustration be used to make informal vernacular histories more physically present? How can illustration contribute to more formally recognised historical and cultural documentation? Is my work a documentation of how knowledge is being preserved? I'm not a formal historian, but is my work trying to document everyday lived experience? How can illustration be used as methodology to examine, document and disseminate what essentially is sociological, anthropological information? So this, I've only just started, guys. So I'm, I'm at the end of my first term, so hence the slight delirium. So this is the point that I'm at. I'm looking at the work I've been making. There's a lot of reflective practice going on. So if anyone wants to throw any references at me and add to my ever-growing reading list, I'm, I'm, I'd be most grateful. And this is my contact if you want to get in touch. Thank you.